So the advent of new technologies brings with it new opportunities, um, especially for solutions to address the digital divide um, and sometimes the gap between regions. So today we're going to be talking about emerging tech in developing markets. Um, I am Emma Joyce, um, Senior Managing Director of GBBC Financial Services and Head of EMEA. Um, it's a delight to be here with you. I've got a really impressive panel for you today. Um, so if I could ask my panellists to please come up and take their seats, we will begin. Thank you so much. And I'm going to ask my panel to please start um, with introductions. So, Anna, could we start with you, please? Yeah, definitely. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you for the invitation and congratulate you uh, immediately about really excellent turnout. I'm the executive director of European Business Association, uh, which is based in Ukraine, which is bringing together 900 companies. Uh, we are the biggest association for foreign business in Ukraine. We are working with international companies and Ukrainian-based uh, firms. And also, around uh, one and a half years ago, we have launched our um, global uh, extraterritorial business development arm, which is titled Global Business for Ukraine. And the idea of that platform is uh, to attract companies who are willing to consider Ukraine as a business destination and help also Ukrainian companies to find their place on the global markets. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Uh, again, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Renat, and the last name is obviously Biktor, if you can see it on the screen. I'm the governor of Astana International Financial Center. That's a financial center created in Astana, capital of Kazakhstan, English law-based jurisdiction, separate from the countries, the rest of the country's jurisdiction in terms of commercial law. Uh, we have opened our doors in 2018, so it's similar to some of the jurisdictions you find in Middle East, for example. And now we have over uh, 2,300 companies registered in AAC. And why I'm part of this panel? Because the jurisdiction is uh, where actually operations with the digital assets or the transactions with the digital assets are allowed in Kazakhstan compared to the mainland. So we have a number of initiatives which I'm going to be talking about. So again, welcome everyone and nice to be here. Thank you. Um, good, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jin Kang, Head of Legal at Hashed. Um, Hashed is foremost a VC headquartered in South Korea with um, regional offices in San Francisco, Singapore, and India. Uh, we are blockchain-focused VC, but also we explore other disruptive technologies, um, and we're trying to um, expedite mass adoption of global blockchain um, initiatives. Uh, we currently manage around 500 million in assets, and um, we invest globally 50% um, into the US, a lot of the infrastructure um, investments, and another 50% in Greater Asia, including India. We also have strategic investments um, out of Europe and now more emerging um, coming from Africa as well. So we cover global um, blockchain investment initiatives, and I'm really glad to be here to share some of my insights with you all today. Wonderful, thank you. Well, well, I'm so glad you're all here with us today. Um, let's start with a big question before we get into the details. Um, and Anna, I'm going to start with you again. What has the adoption of blockchain and digital assets looked like in developing markets broadly? Uh, I can speak about Ukraine and I can share what is, how does it look like in Ukraine, for example. Uh, and I would like to start from saying that uh, we are lucky to have really very progressive digital ministries. So they are really very focusing on the results. And it seems to me that those ones uh, who are following Ukraine probably most likely know the leadership of our ministry. And the guys are coming from business and they came from business. That's why they are very flexible, creative and easy to implement and different things, including blockchain. So um, we had a framework uh, for blockchain being developed and shaped at the current stage. And uh, we also see the adoption of different methods from blockchain on different, uh, in different kinds of life. And one of the prominent I would say uh, probably demonstrator of blockchain introduction in Ukraine is actually public services because we have DIA and DIA City. Uh, DIA City is something similar to what my colleague on the right has also, but focusing financial services, this DIA City focusing IT um, services and technological things. Uh, and it has been um, built uh, using blockchain technologies, 
Plus, we also have in Ukraine blockchain technologies fighting, uh, helping the government to fight corruption. Mm, they also hold, hold various um, registers, state registers uh, using blockchain. And plus, uh, in addition, I can say that um, the evidence of using of blockchain technologies now is military tech. So basically, I'm here just to send you a message. Those ones who are interested about Ukraine, we have really vast opportunities uh, when it comes to blockchain introduction about like military tech. Think about that. By means of this, you will really help to approach the victory for the democratic world. And basically, you will have the, the opportunity to earn money and you will be very profitable in this. Thank you. So very innovative. Okay, I can go. Sure. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, probably I'll start from my experience. As many uh, in Kazakhstan or maybe in the world, I have learned about the blockchain from the digital currencies, right? The Bitcoin, etc. And I come from a traditional financial background. So for me, it wasn't exactly clear. So what is this digital currency and whether it has a future? That was the story like back 10 years ago, right? But then I started to learn more about the technology and then actually same, our digital ministry and government is very open for the new idea. So we have started adopting it in many areas and I think that uh, and we already see there are a lot of uh, values that can the technology add. So it's still a technology, right? So it can be used for right things and the wrong things. And I'm glad you have already mentioned corruption because the transparency, I guess, that the uh, blockchain provides is actually very helpful in fighting that. Uh, one of the examples is that our state-owned, uh, not actually our sovereign wealth fund, which owns the largest state-owned enterprises in the country, uh, have adopted blockchain technology for their procurement system because that's a system where people try to game it and try to use it for their own uh, benefit, especially those who push the button, right, and uh, select who can participate in the procurement, who wins the contract, and etc. So they have in 2018 adopted the blockchain technology to trace like who have when submitted the documents and though you cannot trick the system. This is one of the probably uh, applications that you can find in the government. But apart from that, uh, one of the other applications is obviously CBDC, right? So we, our central bank was among many, uh, among few first countries who have actually developed CBDC. So uh, in 2000, last year, actually 15th of November, that was the 30th anniversary of our national currency Tenge. They introduced digital Tenge, digital currency. They made a first transaction, but I think still that uh, it requires to find the best use for that. For a uh, average citizen, it is not exactly cre clear whether he is using a digital Tenge or he's just using the bank's payment system, settlement system, right? However, I think that it has a long-term implication, exactly the same about use of the public capital and about fighting corruption. So you can actually trace where your public uh, money was put into a project, where did it end up in which pocket, let's say, right? So I think that, again, this has a long-term implication that's going to change the transparency of using the public. I'm, I'm sorry, I am come from a uh, kind of public. official position in public <laughs> sector. That's why I talk about, about the use and of... Traceability <laughs> is always, is always a very good thing. <laughs> yes, also we uh, in the center, we actually have this year adopted the Digital Asset Activities Playbook. This is kind of... Uh, creates exactly the rules for the participants of the market. First one is it's focused on the uh, exchanges. So as I said before, exchanges can register in Kazakhstan. I mean, the digital uh, currency exchanges, crypto exchanges can register only in AFC. We have now six licenses out there. So, but uh, we're also in a sandbox. So the traditional banks and our exchanges have uh, been in a sandbox for one and a half year. Uh, they had uh, around 240 million transactions. So we created the gateway of the uh, crypto assets or crypto currencies to uh, fiat currencies. And uh, based on our this test environment, we are developing the, the full rules so it actually can be rolled out throughout the country. So this is a few examples of uh, how we're developing or what's happening in Kazakhstan. Thank you, some brilliant examples there. Um, Jen. Sure. Um, and I think I, I would like to tell you a little bit about South Korea. And I think it's really helpful to contextualize um, our country just briefly with you. Um, so after the Korean War, um, we had military dictatorship until the 70s. And we didn't really have a democracy in substance until the 80s. Um, and I think if you look economically, um, after the Korean War, we became we uh, evolved from one of the poorest countries in the world to one of the richest now. 
And so if we were to kind of summarize that in very palpable terms, um, the accumulation of wealth um, for our grandparents' generation has been very much based on manufacturing economy. Our parents' generation, um, it's been mostly on real estate and the conglomerates like that you've heard of, Samsung, LG. And for our generation, people in our 20s and 30s, um, the realities are quite stark. Um, after having attended the best university in South Korea, and you become gainfully employed by one of the best you know, uh, employers in Samsung, your monthly income would be around $3,000 um, per month after tax. However, um, an average house in Seoul at the moment is a million dollars. So right now, um, the young generation is faced with a very real problem. How am I going to become relevant and be uh, afforded a safety net to navigate the futures. And so um, if you look into the digital assets and the explosion, I think sometimes we're called ground zero from 2017 in terms of our retail focus on digital assets. It's largely driven by p the younger generation and they largely look at this as a potential to uh, have opportunities for wealth um, accumulation. So in but it didn't really start with digital assets alone. Um, in 2010, it, our um, global participation rate in the global um, derivatives market was number one in the world. Um, if you look at Kostak, for instance, which is the equivalent of Nasdaq in Korea, um, the total transaction volumes are actually driven 88% by retail investors, not financial institutions. And I think there are largely two driving contributing factors to this, which is one, the high degree of education in South Korea, and to um, adopting means of digitization as a means of developing of soft power um, uh, to be relevant in the global stage. So you've had uh, probably heard of 2017 kimchi premium in which Bitcoin was probably trading 50% above the global markets rate. And that was largely driven by, I think, what people call sometimes speculative nature of the people. However, as I've said again, um, it's been largely driven by that kind of foresight that digital assets represent some kind of optimism. On the adoption side, however, the regulatory response in South Korea has not been very cooperative. Um, financial institutions are still not encouraged um, to ha have direct exposure to crypto assets. So most of it is coming from retail. Um, however, that is slowly changing. Um, after implementing the AML Act, uh, we are now going to be amending our Securities Act by the end of the year to allow for STOs. So I think we've had very interesting retail exposure, but I think now the time is right and uh, mature for institutional um, adoption of blockchain to be um, happening on a legally regulated basis. So we look forward to seeing that um, and how that's going to connect to the global markets. If I may add actually a few things, uh, because actually the recent two years uh, which Ukraine ex experiences at the current stage boosted development uh, of uh, blockchain technologies in Ukraine. Because obviously in addition to what I have already mentioned, we use also this blockchain mechanism for cybersecurity also for fundraising, because uh, these are the methods which are heavily used in order to bring positive results uh, to the society. Uh, so when it comes to cybersecurity, I think this is something which is also very important to mention, especially um, when the world is also is going to experience, I think, soon a certain type of issues and challenges. And it seems to me this was one of the uh, topics uh, in, um, in Davos uh, and one of the challenges which we have actually announced when it comes to the cyber security. So here I think that Ukraine can also help to share at least what we have developed. And when it comes to um uh, actually, uh, uh, military tech, we have within two years developed more than 820 registered drone, drones productions uh, using blockchain technologies. So that's why I, I can again repeat, Ukraine is open for blockchain. Ukraine is open for digital assets. And in this respect, we invite you really to cooperate. Thank you. Um, Governor, we've touched on this um, slightly, but what... Um, I guess, what advantages do developing markets have when it comes to adopting new technologies? That, I think, is an excellent question, right? So, first one, I think that the emerging markets, they don't have the legacy of using certain solutions, right? For example, again, in since I come from finance, right, in fintech, uh, countries like Kazakhstan have uh, adopted the technologies that, the, let's say, the 
uh, more mature markets are still struggling to. For example, like a simple example, in the US, they, they still use the checkbooks, right? But in Kazakhstan, we have never seen actually check, checkbook, right? We kind of leap through it. <clears throat> Same in the banking, so you probably, I don't know how many of you heard, we have this, uh, they don't like to call themselves uh, a bank, a fintech company called Caspi, they're actually going through a listing in Nasdaq these days, I think they have now, now the book for subscription is open. So the Caspi has transformed the payment uh, uh, business in Kazakhstan. Prior to Caspi, I think like 60% were cash, 40 was divided between Visa and MasterCard, cashless payments. But these days, I think like a, about 90% of all the transactions are cashless, and about 80 of that is con exactly the Caspi solution. So people use Caspi for, they first introduced QR payments, that was like back on the days, and then only 10% or slightly more than 20 is shared between Master and Visa cards, so the market has significantly shrinked to them. Uh, also, as I said, our digital ministry is very active, so we have, I think, to the UN survey, one of the top 20 or 30 e-governments in the country, so I actually can now sit in a different city and sell my car to someone in a different city without ever seeing him through the Caspi. So I'll just send my car, he can get the license and etc. I'll get my money from the bank. And many, many other services actually are in there. So that's because we didn't have kind of this legacy of using older systems and we can adapt. Same was in uh, AFC. So I used to run before Astana International Exchange. That's part of the AFC, as the name suggests, is an exchange. Again, we were just new, brand new, so we were able to adapt cloud technology earlier than everyone, anyone else. Uh, NASDAQ is our technological partner, was also a shareholder, so we were the first, one of, I think the first, exchange, regulated exchange, who took the NASDAQ's matching engine, that's a trading solution, to a cloud with Amazon Web Services. And now there is a like big cooperation between NASDAQ and AWS about actually using the same model in other markets, but uh, again, this, was we were able to do it because we didn't have the legacy and systems and the cost that we have or investment that we have done through many years so we were easier to adapt i think that's a, a advantage of doing it in an emerging market but again for that you have to have an decision makers policy makers who are open right who can take the risk otherwise you kind of uh, try to replicate what is safer what everyone has done before you and then you are lagging behind so again uh, this has a certain uh, preconditions to be able to adapt to a new technologies yeah i think um those points are spot on and i totally agree with you can we get rid of checks please what is that about i hate them um, <laughs> this is still weird <laughs> leftover i don't understand it. <laughs> me neither um jen what are your thoughts um I think, as Governor said, I think leapfrogging is probably the most advantage for emerging markets. Um, but I think for that leapfrogging to happen, there has to be a company a regulatory framework. And I think, as Governor also said, there needs to be open-minded policymakers. The realities are, if you want to um, offer very innovative services in these markets, um, you have to have a supporting legislation. And right now, what we have is a FATF guidance on VASPs, and the ones that they are aiming to regulate is mostly focused on AML. Um, and so you're looking at exchanges, custodian service providers, and wallet service providers. Um, and so because um, these are limited to the regulatory framework, in South Korea, for instance, if you are a gaming company that has NFTs, there is a question whether you are a CASP or a VASP. And unfortunately, our financial regulators, um, FSC, has refused to really consider other business models um, that could be very encompassed into the innovative services that we can offer. So instead of enlarging the scope of VASP, what we've done in Korea instead is to actually define major VASPs. So we are only now looking at legislating and regulating three types. Um, so exchanges, once again, custodian services and wallet service providers. So you have an entire business ecosystem within blockchain industry that is left without any regulatory clarity. And so while I think leapfrogging presents a very interesting opportunity, especially from a VC perspective. But without that regulatory clarity, um, unfortunately, they, they need to go hand in hand. And I think that's one of the problems that we're currently facing at the moment. Thank you. Um, Anna, what are your thoughts? 
I'm just thinking to my colleagues at the panel, and I was, I was thinking, what can I say about Ukraine? Because Ukraine is currently in the war, and uh, it's very difficult, probably, to invite investors to the country, which is uh, at the fire zone. But still, I think that what can be offered to the digital investors and to virtual things, I think that this is something which can definitely continue and could be done even during wartime. And uh, even on the contrary, it, is, could, it could be even more use, useful, because you could test on the battlefield some technologies which could use also blockchain. So it's like a testing, you know, polygon testing platform, unfortunately, of course, for Ukrainians, but nevertheless, uh, it can be done like this. And since uh, virtual digital business can be done also online, I think that it is really definitely secure for those ones who would really dare to think about investing or making business with Ukraine. And I would like to ask uh, all of you, who of you is present in Ukraine or who of you is, who's who of you is doing business already with Ukraine? Only you? Yes, one, two, three, not more. Who is interested uh, to come into Ukraine? One, two, three, not so. But so basically those ones who is interested, we are more than happy to, to consider and discuss opportunities of cooperation. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, Jin, we've talked about the advantages. What are the disadvantages for emerging markets? Um, a very interesting question. Um, <laughs> I think, um, as I've said, we're very interested in India as the kind of next explosive hub for blockchain adoption. And part of that reason is because you have a younger generation who's very also very well educated. And I think in 2024, you will have a larger graduating engineering school of um, recent graduates that outpaces the US for the first time. And so when we're talking about emerging countries, sometimes they talk about the lack of skilled force. Um, I actually think this is a little bit of a misconceived notion and a little bit of hubris on the West to think that, for instance, in other parts of nature, uh, in, um, in the world, you don't necessarily have as much um, developed and sophisticated engineers. Blockchain is an open source movement. You have GitHub, you have other resources that are available to you. And so actually the disadvantages that we think um, um, that there is lack of skilled workers is actually not true. And so I was in India in December in Bangalore, where you have all the um, global IT companies um, headquartered there. And we had a blockchain uh, conference. And the people who were showing up were um, college graduates in their 20s and 21 year olds who were building products on top of you know layer ones already and so and in Korea nowadays actually one of our per most perf um, uh, best performing uh, portfolio company in South Korea right now is a adult engineering education camp in which we provide um, engineering um, education for free um, in uh, in participate it, it for it gives you um, an ability to participate a, a small share of your future revenue in terms of your employment gains. And so that's been very um, happening and we've seen 18% exclusive growth. And another example we see in Japan is um, Keio University has launched a similar initiative in which they provide access to free education online. And as a result of your graduation, you get an NFT certificate and people are even able to sponsor you and do crowdsourcing into your future development as a potential investor as you as a person. And so there are global initiatives, you know, um, that are going to empower your education movements. And so um, what we now think of a disadvantage is actually becoming more of an advantage for the emerging markets. Okay, I like how you turned that round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I may add, uh, I wouldn't say it's a disadvantage, but actually a challenge of adopting a new technologies, new solutions in the emerging markets as as the classification of emerging markets suggests, is the risk or uncertainty, which translates into a cost of capital uh, and actually ch what Anna is trying to do, attract investors into the country. So attracting actually money, big investors, is the biggest probably challenge because a lot of these new technologies, at the startup stage, they require moderate capital, but when you want to actually scale it up, that requires significant uh, amount of capital. Just an example, right, that again, not maybe about blockchain, but everyone now talking about the hot topic of the Davos 2024 is AI, right? So, and AI requires a lot of the computing power, right? So you have to invest in a computing power, and now with the huge line for NVIDIA chips and et cetera, that is that they, they cost a lot, right? The same challenge we face. So. We started this project with the uh, United Arab Emirates-based G42 on actually 
building a computer in Kazakhstan so we can develop uh, uh, large language models for Kazakh or maybe Turkic languages and actually exactly expanding our capacity of uh, computing capacity. But again, the cost of capital is big. So you have to have a certain, not certain, very, you have to be very confident about your business model and then how you're gonna translate that computing power in actually cash, right? So that's a probably the biggest, uh, biggest uh, challenge. And with this environment of high interest rate, even though people there in the Congress hall talking about the lowering, the, uh, the, the probability of lowering interest rate, I mean, it's still very expensive. So you have the basis, the cost of in US dollars high, you have then the risks because of the situation in our geography uh, have widened, uh, the, the, uh, the cost of capital is enormous, right? So this is the probably the biggest challenge, right? And not everyone you seen the raised hands, right? No, not many are willing Ask to take Kazakhstan. the risk. It's Ask okay. about Kazakhstan. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> as as an as as an, uh, former portfolio manager, I understand, right? So you have to have a certain investment thesis, and actually, you don't want to take a, a, a extensive risk because of your biases, right? And there has to be a, a rational decision. But this is a challenge on our side about attracting the capital. So I think this is a, one of the biggest challenges that the many emerging markets share. Others are different from place to place. So for example, uh, in countries with the smaller population like Kazakhstan, we have also challenge of scalability, right? Making a project actually uh, grow in the countries like China, India, probably it's a less of an issue, but they have the issues of their own. But again, the cost of capital is one that many of them share, many of us share. <laughs> Thank you. In our case, uh, of course, the biggest challenge is war. Uh, and obviously, everybody is afraid actually to think even about Ukraine because it's war there. Uh, but nevertheless, nevertheless, when it comes to skilled labor, uh, I would just like to remind that before the war, we used to have actually a really uh, IT sector, which were growing immensely. And we were talking about really times uh, increases of um, this business uh, every year. So the profitability was really skyrocketing. And we had also the availability of labor, which was sufficient enough for the IT sector to grow. So in this respect, still, you know, the labor remains in the country. But also, of course, this is a challenge when it comes to mobilization of people. So that's why uh, we cannot hide that. Obviously, the youngsters, they could be drafted to the army in order to protect the, the, the country. And of course, it presses also to a certain extent the, uh, the industry, the economic the economic side of the country. Although uh, when it comes to the good news, uh, just today or yesterday, the government of Ukraine actually uh, changed the law uh, a little bit, the resolution which allowed to keep for the economy when it comes to defense and military tech, all those people's, people who are uh, who are involved. So basically those ones who would be working for military tech, for defense industry, would be uh, reserved uh, for the economy. So they will not be mobilized to the army. It opens the opportunity for digital business, or blockchain business, for virtual business actually, uh, who could produce military technology to use labor, which is really creative, flexible, resilient, and pretty brave to bring your profits uh, for the long future. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't know that. It's really interesting. Um, we've got 10 minutes left, and I've got two questions that I really want to get to. Um, so, Governor, can I start with you, please, on collaboration? And um, how can, or is it already happening, um, are devel more developed markets working with developing markets on, I guess, creating regulation and fostering innovation? Well, of course it's happening. I mean, uh, again, as Jim mentioned, that it is, uh, for example, in the blockchain technology, you want to have a, a proper regulation. That's probably the challenge that the crypto industry is facing now. The, 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 uh, they want to apply the regulation and be credible for institutional investors, for example, but at the same time stay uh, agile, right, and not be over-regulated, and then emerge, and they set the trend, right? I mean, so we emerging markets kind of try to, uh, we follow because the, the framework of what you have also mentioned, AML, uh, the transparency, etc., it's actually led by the developed markets, well, let's say US, right, namely. <laughs> and then we have to follow, we have to have the regulations that at least are uh, on 
par or similar so that we don't get into the list that we don't want to be in, right? So that, and, uh, and uh, the regulators from the developed markets are ready to share what their thinking is, how they, why they're doing uh, these things and taking certain decisions and uh, setting up uh, funds. And they said also that the, to adopt the technologies, you need capital. So uh, again, there are certain pools of capital that are put together by either public institutions, meaning IFIs, international financial institutions, or the private sector that kind of help for more struggling uh, or uh, economies that have less resources to bring the technologies and adopt them for their own economy. So I think it's happening whether this needs more uh, collaboration and more resources. Well, obviously, yes, I would say, right? There is always uh, room for more resources and for more capital. Uh, but it is what it is. At least, I mean, like some effort is behind it. And then you, of course, want uh, more push. Thank you. And I think we could, no, that was great. I think we could talk regulation for hours, but we do have a very good regulation. Let's not focus on regulation. It's going to get us, dragged us in a very exactly. long discussion. We've got a very good regulation panel um, later this afternoon, actually. Um, so perhaps because I know we don't have long, we've only got about seven minutes left. Let's move on to the last question, which I really want to tr um, cover. Um, as you know, one of the topics for WEF this year is trust. So how can blockchain technology improve trust in public institutions and systems in developing markets? Jin, can I start with you on that, please? Um, I think we have esteemed colleagues um, working in governments and from various public sectors. Um, so I think maybe they should be speaking on this topic. <laughs> um, but I actually wanted to talk about the role of VCs in the overall ecosystem. Um, I think after like FTX, um, even Terra in Korea, um, I think there are a lot of responsibilities that VCs fit, um, should bear um, in funding a lot of early stage um, companies and applications in blockchain industry. And so um, I think in California, for instance, they try to have a you know um, gender equality or disclosure for um, gender inequalities um, in companies that they invest. Um, so in terms of, I think, what VC should be doing is to really think about what are some of the sustainable growth that could contribute to the overall trust in the blockchain ecosystem. So one concrete example that I would like to say is that um, you have some MEV problems. So one potential company that you could invest into maximizes bad MEVs and it will give you very immediate, strong returns in short period of time. Is that a sustainable uh, investment that contributes to the overall building, rebuilding of trust? Absolutely not. We had another um, company that we saw that actually tried to fight against the bad MEV attacks. So instead of allowing for front, you know front running, back running, sandwich running, um, we all they what they tried to do was decouple the sequencing and the execution, and then they use zk solutions so that you know the sequencing layer would be protected. And we thought this would be a sustainable and actually directly addressing some of concrete problems that is hurting the trust in the blockchain ecosystem. And so I think VCs have a very interesting role um, that should be mandated and we should really be um, talking about some of the directives coming from public institutions and having that as part of our investment mandate should be something that we should really be thinking about. Thank you. Um, Anna, what are your thoughts on how blockchain technology can improve trust? Uh, I think it's already happening in Ukraine because, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have the system DIA, which it increases the number of public services which the society can use. And it is used without corruption, freely, transparently, and I can just simply show you that actually in the telephone you can use passports and driving licenses, you can get access to literally every register which is actually available in the state. And I think this is something which the country was to concentrate on, to focus on and expand further the range of services which the population and the business can actually get from the state. So in this respect, it only gains trust. We are, uh, because actually the digital ministry in Ukraine did not ever lost the trust. And they are busy with blockchain and they even introduced the course 
in DIA when it comes to the blockchain development so that everyone who is interested in Ukraine when it comes to blockchain, they have access to the educational material. So in this respect, I can only really say big thank you to our government in the digital sphere, which are doing really fantastic job. And I think this job is being acknowledged by other players because I know that even not only emerging countries are interested in buyers, in buying this DIA um, service, but actually developed countries are buying that from Ukraine. So basically, in this respect, I think that it only confirms that we have trust. Thank you. And may I add, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, again, I mean, uh, I think blockchain is what they call a double-edged, it's a technology that is kind of a double-edged sword, like compared to be, and in exactly aspect of a transparency, the both edges are super sharp, in my view. So on one side, I mean, like uh, we talked about that it can increase the transparency. I gave the examples of how the smart contracts and et cetera can uh, help to increase the transparency. At the same time, because of the cryptocurrencies and what they've been or are used, they actually have qu the, the, the public uh, decision makers, policy makers, the, the, the uh, law enforcers have actually questions about the transparency of the transactions, right? So they actually associate cryptocurrencies, hence technology with actually having a lack of transparency, right? Then it requires education of those people who think uh, in that way, right? So they have to explain the technology, that it's not only about the cryptocurrencies, that it's actually technology can be used for uh, enhancing the transparency and uh, the framework uh, that the decisions can be made on. So it requires, again, a lot of the educating your decision maker, showing them the benefits of the technology. Uh, and I mean, I hope this is not a secret to anyone, right? There is a lot of the concerns about what this technology can be used from the uh, again, the policymakers' point of view. And that's what we're working on <laughs> this week, particularly. Um, I'm on <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to my panel. Um, a really great discussion. I'm afraid we don't have time for questions, um, but um, if you do um, have any, please um, ask us at a later opportunity. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to the audience, and um, do stay because we've got you. a fantastic lineup.